it was around this time of year, mid-January-ish, when along the banks of a river in northern Italy, a group of men gathered to contemplate their next move and, in many ways, the future. Most of the credit for that moment would go to one man, Gaius Julius Caesar. It's a name you're probably familiar with. It's a name you probably know. And you probably even know what he said when he was there. You may not know it in the sense of this is what he said, but you know it because you've probably said it yourself at some point. It was a moment of decision that had to be made, but it was not a decision that was easily made. You need to understand that. Caesar understood exactly what was going to happen if he did what he was about to do. It would precipitate a civil war. The Roman Republic would find itself engaged in a civil war on one side would be Caesar and his acolytes. On the other side would be the great Pompey, who was one of the greatest leaders of the Roman Republic, one of its most favored sons. The Civil War would not end until 31 BCE. At the Battle of Actium, Caesar himself would already be dead. His son, his, his replacement, a guy by the name of Octavian, you probably know him better as Augustus, would defeat a man by the name of Mark Antony and his ally Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. And that would essentially end the war. There was more to that story, obviously, because both Caesar and Cleopatra made it back to Egypt, where they were hunted down and destroyed, finally, by Augustus. It was a moment of important consideration. Lives were hanging in the balance. Caesar himself would claim that he was defending the Republic, and that somehow or another his decision on this day would be designed to save the Republic of Rome. I don't know what was in his mind. I can't tell you. I wasn't there. He didn't see fit necessarily to write down the entirety of what he thought at that particular moment. But somehow, my gut tells me that he understood that if he won, he was going to establish himself as the dictator for life. And that was the plan all along. The Republic itself had become corrupt. It had become crumbling. Despite Pompey's efforts to restore it and to save it, it had become just a, a shadow of its former self. And it was scary almost in so many ways how, how tragic the empire, the, the Republic had become. It wasn't the empire yet and wouldn't be the empire until after the Battle of Actium. But there was something else involved here as Caesar stood on the banks of the Rubicon River. Caesar understood that if he crossed that river with his army, he was committing an act of treason against the Republic. Now, you can argue in your head, well, I'm, I'm saving the Republic all you want. But he knew that the law was very particular and very precise. If he did this thing, he was, in fact, committing treason. And treason is punishable by death. It's intriguing to me because obviously Caesar knew that. and. Even though he knew it, he had rationalized in his own mind that I'm doing this out of necessity and planned on being successful at it. Which, of course, most rebellions plan on being successful, with few exceptions. Uh, but as a general rule of thumb, they try to be successful. Caesar knew all this in his head. But what's remarkable to me looking at this, you know, more than 2,000 years later, is that there were hundreds, if not thousands, 
of other men there who had to have the same decision. The army itself, the, every officer in that legion had to decide whether they were going to cross that river because every officer in that legion knew that if they stepped foot into the Rubicon River, they were guilty of treason and the penalty for treason is death. Every centurion had to decide for him or for himself that if I step foot into the Rubicon River, it's treason and its sentence for treason is death. And every single soldier in that region, in that legion, sorry, well, probably the region too, had to decide for himself. Do I step, do I follow Julius Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar to Rome? Or do I live by the code that I've lived my entire life by? Which do I do? Every one of them had to decide for themselves. And as Caesar would be quoted later as saying, Alia iachta iest. The die has been cast. And we know in history that he crossed the Rubicon River. The Civil War was long and bloody. And he did not live to see the end of it. There were those who, in their own way, had to cross their own Rubicons as they decided that he was too dangerous. And so they killed him in an insurrection in the Ides of March. Remember this? <clears throat> it's fascinating history, but it's also a lot of lessons for us that maybe we can contemplate, and I certainly find myself contemplating them today as I look at some of the things that are happening in the world. It's easy to see international Rubicons, as it were. My text machine this morning keeps going off with, with text. Here's a uh, Here's one of the latest ones that I've, I've just seen. Uh, former Ukrainian defense minister says a Russian operation against Ukraine now appears inevitable. It, 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 we're going we're to go to war. There will be a war in Ukraine. Now, whether or not that means that, uh, you know, what does that mean? I don't, U.S. says Russia made no commitment to de-escalate. This is literally within the last five minutes. Okay, this isn't something... Uh, NATO chief warns of real risk of conflict as talks with Russia over Ukraine come to an end. It's easy to see the Rubicon that is Ukraine. We're going to have to stand on the banks and make a decision. What are we going to do? Are we going to involve ourselves? Are we going to take actions which might lead to bigger problems downstream? Who knows? I don't know what our leaders are thinking. Our leaders seem paralyzed by, I wouldn't call it indecision, I would call it confusion. Once upon a time, they were against Russia. Now they seem to be for Russia. Now they seem to be, well, the other side is against Russia, so I must be for Russia. We're almost letting our own internal politics dictate whether or not we will be for or against something, which is crazy, no matter how you look at it. Ukraine is... It's a scary situation. I've said this before, and I will probably keep saying it's a, it's a theme I will keep harping on over the next bit of time, and that is, it's July 1914 thinking. It's the July crisis of 1914. We're looking back at July 1914 and go, those people were insane. How could they not see what they were about to do over what? And are we not in the same situation now? And our leaders seem equally paralyzed. And no matter how many people scream at them, hey, this is a really stupid idea. This is a really bad Rubicon to cross. This is a really bad die to cast. It almost seems like they have to do it anyway. In 1914, there was a lot of difficulty in July of 1914 convincing the average person on the street that going to war particularly over Serbia, was a great idea. There were a lot of, lot of difficulty convincing people of that. But somehow, some way, they managed to do it. And they managed to convince millions upon millions of people to march to their deaths in a war that, to this day, still makes no sense. 
It just doesn't. World War I is fascinating to me. I've said this on many occasions. I have the entire official records of World War I over there. I, I'm enthralled by World War I, primarily because to me it was the last mono-on-mono -mono naval war. Uh, World War II would be replaced by radar and over-the-horizon aircraft and stuff like that. World War I was the last time you really had to sail up next to your enemy and, and fight. It's fascinating to me, and it, but, and it was the birth of the submarine and those kinds of things. But it was an insane war, completely unnecessary. But they crossed the Rubicon, the, they cast the die, and what do they have to show for it? Literally, literally nothing. We see other Rubicons today. We see Taiwan, which has kind of faded in the last few weeks. North Korea is throwing around quote unquote hypersonic missiles. I personally don't believe that, but they claim that they did. Kazakhstan is a mess. And even for all of those, they worry me. They concern me. They cause me to be, you know, what the heck's going on here? Even in all of that, I'm not so sure that those are the ones that really worry me as much as the domestic Rubicons worry me, the ones here in my country. You know, Bill and I had a rather, Bill Rod and I had a rather extensive discussion yesterday. Yesterday on Bill's show, I made some comment about uh, which, which amendment had been most damaging, and one of the callers to the show had postulated that it was the 17th Amendment was the most damaging to our republic. And I, I get that the 17th Amendment has issues, but for me it was the 16th Amendment that really shattered the myth that we're a republic. I mean, it really did. Talk about standing on a Rubicon right now when people realize what, what the 16th Amendment actually caused, and they haven't yet. I, I know you have, and I know I have, but most people have not. Most people think it's still about paying your fair share. And if everybody would just contribute, then everything would be great. They don't understand what the 16th Amendment gave the government the power to do. Even in that, when people realize, start realizing that, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a Rubicon. But right now, we have the Rubicon of the inflation. I know it seems... Every time you start talking about economics, listeners' eyes glaze over. They, people don't understand this stuff because it's intentionally obfuscated. It's made difficult on purpose. What you need to understand, if I could make it any simpler than this, I, and I can't, Inflation is a tax. That's all it is. It's a, right now, well, it was 6%. In the time I've literally been doing the show, I've gotten another tweet. Inflation came in at 7%. It is a 7% tax on everything. So your dollar today buys 7% less. I mean, it's, it's a 7% tax. It's, our state sales tax here is 10%. Make it 17%. That's effectively what it's done because it increases the prices. It lowers your buying power. And the truth of the matter is, is that on food, inflation right now is running closer to 30%. There was a post yesterday on one of my social media feeds about this inflation. And one of the reactions to it was interesting because we've been talking about this at great length the last few days. And the response was, this is why I don't mind what happened on January 6th, because somebody's going to have to stand up. So we're going to have to cross a Rubicon at some point and say to these people, this is not acceptable. We're going to have to stand up and each one of us is going to have to decide for ourselves. What are we going to do? There's the Rubicon of government power. My state governor, Jay Zero Inslee, gave the state of the state of Washington yesterday speech. I did not watch because, again... I don't really care that much. I don't think that he's got his stuff together enough to even pay attention to, to be honest with him. But the, the opening thunder of his speech was, we have to take action. We, have to, we need more action on the things that he cares about, climate change, homeless issues, COVID. And after the speech, there was a group of state legislators, bipartisan, oddly enough, who 
were asked about and who made comments about the fact that the legislature needs to take some action to start limiting the governor's powers, his emergency powers. I've talked about this with state of emergency for 680 some odd days now. And there are those in our state government who think that when does the emergency end? When, when does the Caesar be told, okay, there's no more emergency. You don't need to be the dictator anymore. Go home. When does that happen? And Inslee's response to this was remarkable. He basically said, why would you do, why do you want people to die? I'm saving lives here. And by the way, 27 times you legislators have agreed to extend my state of emergencies or, 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 or take action on the state of emergency. So you agree with me anyway. So the idea of one man, one rule has become de facto here in the state of Washington. We are not a Republican form of government here in the state of Washington anymore. We are, in fact, a one-man dictatorship. Now, you can make the argument, okay, Dave, it's a benign dictatorship, it's a, but it's not. It is suppressing people's rights. It is suppressing people's privileges. It is forcing people to do things that morally are objectionable to them. And there's a Rubicon River flowing here, and all of us are standing on the banks of that. None of us listening today, none of you listening today, none of me talking today, are going to be the leaders of any kind of crossing of the Rubicon. Who that person is, ultimately, I don't know who it will be. But none of us probably are that person. But that doesn't mean that we're not standing on the banks of the Rubicon as well, just like those centurions, just like those officers, just like those soldiers, legionnaires. We're going to have to decide for ourselves. Each and every one of us is going to have to decide when the moment comes. Do we put our foot in that river and cross over, knowing that we're going to be labeled as the bad guys, knowing that we're going to be labeled as the insurrectionists, even if we're not, even if we think we're not? Are we going to stand up to preserve what's left of our crumbling republics? I don't know. I wish I could tell you definitively that we shouldn't have to. That's the part that bothers me. We shouldn't have to do this. Clearly, something's about to give. Like the Roman Republic of 49 BCE. There's too much pressure. There's too much strain. There's too much corruption and over-government. And at some point, the die will be cast.